Uh, and uh, some of you are going to be happy for us to finish Amos because the negativity, the judgment, the harshness, the violence of the judgment all has, uh, well, it hasn't sounded typical to the way we've been uh, socialized to be Christians. And uh, part of that's, uh, well, part of that's just the way we are socialized to be Christians because had we lived uh, in another century or two back, uh, probably it would have sounded just normal, kind of harsh, judgmental, negative kind of language. A and so uh, uh, I, I know there's, there's that. Th there's uh, essentially uh, two things that Amos kept hammering away at through the book. Uh, one uh, might be called social justice in terms of large categories, his concern for the poor, the mistreatment of the marginalized, his, uh, even it seems sometimes, anger at folks with wealth and luxury who acquired the wealth and luxury at the expense of folks uh, who didn't have as much and, and didn't have the ability, the power to resist uh, these people taking over some of their properties and uh, putting them in debt and uh, um, et cetera. Uh, the other piece that he's concerned about is worship. And uh, again, sort of a two-sided issue for him. He, he's quite unhappy at Baal worship and worship of the idols of other nations, and, and sort of the syncretism or the mixture or the watering down of Israel's religion. Um, and secondly, he is concerned about worship that is done uh, externally, but there's nothing in the heart to go with it. Uh, so going through the motions of sacrifices, of festival days, of all the kinds of things that were prescribed by Scripture itself to be done as expressions of worship, uh, but just sort of marking time through those things, seeing them as a way to manage or manipulate God rather than an expressions of hearts uh, desiring to love God and to love neighbor. And so uh, e even in the passage we started last week, we'll continue today, uh, you, you see that issue at work once again. So. Let's read again. We read this last week. Let's read chapter 8, verses 4 to 14. Uh, we've gotten in about a verse or so of that in our discussion, and we'll pick up wherever you want to pick up. So let's read together, shall we? Hear this, you that trample on the needy, and bring to the poor of the land, saying, When will the living be over, so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will, we will make, make the effort small and, and the shackle great, and, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who lives in it, and all of it rise like the Nile? and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and boldness on every dead. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, the beautiful young women and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by Hashemah of Samaria and say, As your God lives, O them, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Responses. This is the word of the Lord. Really? <laughs> sort of, thanks be to God. Huh? <laughs> Famine. Isn't that a powerful metaphor there? Famine of the word of the Lord. That's just, that's just scary. It's, it's almost like a 
almost to her today. Okay. What would that look like? What does it look like here as he describes it? You know, you almost wonder if, since it's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing, that they may not even realize there's a famine until they go to hunt for it and they can't find it. Okay. The issue is food and water, right? At least that, I mean, it's uh, not a famine of bread or thirst of water. What's the function of bread and water? Yeah, keep you alive. A and for the poor folks, uh, they tended to have two meals a day in the morning, bread and water. In the evening, bread and hot water. Uh, boiled on whatever the last bone of the last animal they had any meat off of would be, which means the broth gets pretty thin after a couple months. Yeah, so, so th there's an assumption there about the word of the Lord. Uh, it's an assumption, uh, the first I am saying of Jesus. John 6. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And I think you're right, Marcia, that most of us don't think about Scripture as the bread of life, or Jesus even as bread of life. Uh, well, that's a metaphor. It's something spiritual. Uh, I'm hungry. And when we say I'm hungry, we mean I want food. Uh, a sense, well, in the first temptation, the temptation to turn the stones to bread, Jesus' response, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, is what? A person does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do any of you believe that? You take it for granted. Yeah. We spiritualize it pretty easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a part of what Deuteronomy had in mind, I think, in the uh, Exodus, 40 years in the wilderness, how did they live? Where did the manna come from? It, it wasn't a natural phenomena. It wasn't planting and harvesting. It wasn't making money and buying at the grocery store. It, it was waking up every morning and seeing if God had spoken manna into existence another day. And so the, the Deuteronomy text, I think, is this sense that food existed because God decided and spoke the enabling, empowering kind of word. Uh, if you think a little bit about it, where does the food that we eat come from? Well, meat comes from animals. All the rest of it comes from? plants. A and where did plants and animals come from? In Genesis 1, God said, let there be. And there was. A and so all, even, even the stuff that we eat is the product of the Word of God. Um, and, and so I don't think we think about it. So famine of the Word of God could be that God doesn't speak the enabling words that allow food to come into production. Oh, we're pretty sure we just plant the right seeds, do the right agricultural technique. Uh, it, it'll all be there. Not if there's no rain. That, that's, uh, yeah, not if there's no rain. <laughs> that's why I'm here. Uh, our, my dad lost five straight crops, and we lost the farm. Uh, I moved to town and learned English. Uh, I mean, learned Spanish. Uh, We have been kind of uh, overwhelmed by a, a naturalistic sort of worldview, rather than even assuming that God speaks these words. But I, I think, nevertheless, that it's being used metaphorically here. Th there's famine, there's thirst, there's lack, there's dying for God's speaking. So what kinds of things do, do does God does speak? What kinds of things? Besides animals and plants. Okay, he speaks so the word that brings life. Okay. 
What's your favorite Christological title? Sorry, just a random thought here. Favorite title for Jesus? I don't know if that's your favorite. You know, that's where I was headed for. We, we'd work through Jesus and Christ and Lord and Son of God. And, and eventually one of you would figure out, I want the word as... That's the word, pardon the pun, <laughs> that's the, the uh, whatever, that John uses in the very opening part of his gospel to describe Jesus. He was God articulated, speaking. Uh, and, and how much depends on us, for us, depends on that word from God. Well, we wouldn't be here this morning anyway. We might be out trying to make food happen, but we wouldn't be in church if God hadn't spoken the word called Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so what would famine of God's word, and a part of what I think we need to get past is thinking of it only as written Bible. It's living word Jesus, it's written word scripture, it's preached word sermons, it's also God speaking into reality all kinds of things in our lives that matter. Uh, does love matter to any of you? The source of that is God, creating the context in which love can happen, the reality of love. Uh, not all of you are orthodox because um, you've forgotten. <laughs> uh, we live in a culture that's really dismissed the idea of sin and original sin, depravity. We believe in the inherent goodness of people which uh, scripture doesn't quite have that sense of optimism. Uh, so how do you learn to love? Authentically love as opposed to selfishly love. And, and we have folks who selfishly love, desiring things for their own benefit and to use for themselves, to manipulate for themselves. But where do we learn the kind of love that gives of self? It's from God again. So what would a famine of the word of the Lord do to a culture? Hmm. Mark? We don't know exactly what's happened since Elton Trueblood said that in the 1950s and 60s, we were a cut flower generation. In other words, the flowers of the nation were rooted in the word of God and there was a consistent concerted effort to move them away from Christianity to just quote general principles mm -hmm. and so you have seen that progression in the 50s and 60s where there was that conscious separation between the good ideas that grew from Christianity and trying to keep those alive and yet have continued to wither. Okay. Interesting here, <clears throat> they wander from sea to sea, from north to west. They run to and fro seeking the word of God because part of what's at work in our culture is trying to find those realities again <coughs> without the soil without the roots and uh, not only is it getting harder it's always been hard uh, the distance is so far the flower is so faded uh, the memory of the reality is in many cases not even existing anymore Jess? A, a secular sociologist in the 1960s warned uh, the western culture particularly once you do away with the sense or the idea of the sacred, you do away with any foundation on which any value structure can be created. And then it becomes each person for themselves creating what value is. And he said, the, uh, this is 19, in the 60s, the outcome will be chaos and division, and it will likely occur within our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I thought of that, uh, In Amos's time, 
it flowed out of worship that was mechanical but not authentic and a kind of self-centeredness that tried to absorb everything for oneself rather than the benefit of the society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's th that's the consequence, yeah. Well, you guys jumped to the funnest part of this passage to talk. Mm -hmm. Elbow? Are you gonna help us no. with this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, trouble? Verse 11, God says, I will send a famine. A famine of hearing the word of the Lord. I live my life trusting that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And this sounds like a contradiction of that. Where to grab this snake? <laughs> <laughs> Near the head. Uh, I think the answer is simple. It depends on who the us is. Yeah, that's a way to put it. Because <laughs> Old Testament faith is built on covenant. And a part of the covenant formula is these are the expectations God has for Israel. And if they obey, blessing will come. And if they disobey, uh, not just curses you're foiled again, but the kinds of undermining of uh, individual flourishing uh, so that health may, 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 uh, may, may have ill health because of disobedience. Uh, you may have poverty, disobedience. You may suffer violence in a society because of disobedience. The nation will lose to other nations. The economy will go in the tank, according to God. These are the punishments. Uh, that was set up in, uh, well, it's already in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, the blessings and the curses that happen. And uh, <clears throat> you've got this century after century uh, history of Israel northern kingdom in particular, living in violation of that covenant, which means for God to not be a liar, which is another thing I think you value, for God not to be a liar, then he must bring some kind of judgment against them. And in a certain sense, part of the wonder and grace and perplexion of the Old Testament is why God didn't destroy them earlier and how it is God keeps given more chances and how it is he gives more chances and, and how the prophets in particular explain the fact that God was faithful and truthful to his covenant but didn't abandon his people. For example, uh, in Isaiah, the concept that he develops is a remnant. So that the us depends on the remnant. There is a remnant for whom God continues to be gracious and faithful and never changing, and, but there's a, 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 whatever the non-remnant is, the majority that have been disobedient are going to suffer these consequences. In Jeremiah, uh, it, it's a new covenant. He says, I'm going to do a new covenant. That's how I'm going to manage the fact that I'm going to destroy the people in the old covenant, but I don't want to lose the people of God. I'm going to make a new covenant. And in Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 31, where does the new covenant reside? In the hearts, so it's the people who have internalized into themselves uh, this relationship, this covenant with God. In Ezekiel, it's he's going to put a new spirit in people's hearts, mm -hmm. so he's going to do a a new life for certain folks. A a a and so I think uh, <laughs> God sends the famine, mm -hmm. not in the sense of God saying, ah, "I've had it with these people; I'm going to kill them all," which is you could read this section and make it sound like that, but they have disobeyed and disobeyed and disobeyed. I am now going to put into action, set into place the processes that will bring the judgments that were promised to back in Deuteronomy uh, for this kind of disobedience. Um, now, we may fool around so much we will take two Sundays to finish. When we get to the end of chapter 9, you're going to find Amos being optimistic. Mm -hmm. 
Amos saying, you know, God is going to rebuild this whole thing. Not with all the same folks. There will be folks who are lost. But he's going to take a remnant, he's going to take a portion, he's going to take a group that have been faithful, and he's going to rebuild the whole thing and restore the remnant of the house of David uh, kind of thing. So, so there is optimism, but in a certain sense, God saying, I will send a famine, is God saying, I, I got to follow through on what I said the conditions were going to be when we started this whole relationship. Isn't it a little bit like sending a child to bed without a supper? I mean, you love him, but you're training him. Boy, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the old-fashioned way. <laughs> we, <laughs> I, I was raised with spankings. When I spanked Timothy, he just looked up and he said, are you done? <laughs> so I'd spank him again. He says, okay, you done yet? <laughs> and, and so for Timothy, we figured, find and discover the only way to punish him was not let him have a book, take his books away. <laughs> he would cry and, whine and crawl and behave in order to get his books back. <laughs> he didn't care about supper. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's you, you got to find what punishes. Right. And, and God had a system of a series of things. And, and in this, there's a certain sense the famine of the word of God isn't God saying, I'm jerking my word. It's I'm turning you over to the consequences of the pattern that you've been living now for these years. And that pattern has consequences. And a part of it is you've ignored the source for so long you will no longer be able to find the source once again. Bruce? Is it also possible that, like, you know, just like with the famine, before that, everything's so plentiful and whatnot, you don't realize the blessing that you have. So whenever it's taken away, you're searching for that thing that, that is not there. So Christ being the source of life and the source of what they need and the, the originator of blessing and that sort of thing, whenever that's removed, it says they search from sea to sea, north to east, you know, so on. And so with, with it being withdrawn, it gets the people that Attention. search for God mm -hmm. to actually open their eyes, like, what is different? We've got to go find God. And that's kind of what it seems like there. It's like we have, our eyes are open. It's like the scale mm -hmm. is pulled up. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is what we need to which is Which is really scary if you were to think about where we are in this country in these days because of the generosity with which God has bestowed blessing upon us for so many, well, centuries of, of natural resources, of human resources, all kinds of things. Uh, Tom? Um, this might sort of go along with what Bruce was saying. Uh, so eventually God did stop sending them prophets for a while, so mm -hmm. there were there was silence in that regard for four hundred years or whatever. Yeah. But by the time Jesus showed up, they were trying pretty hard to be religious and monotheistic and do the right thing. And maybe part of it was in response. Mm -hmm. Well, of course they've been to Babylon and back, but part of it maybe was because they were missing hearing from the prophets. I think there's evidence of that. Uh, they were keenly aware there was a 400-year hiatus, and no prophecy, no, no demonstration of the Spirit of God at work in their nation, which is prophecy was one of the ways they saw that. A and uh, they wondered why. A and it, in a certain sense, it used to seem to me that all the Gospels exaggerated the response to John the Baptist. Everybody went out to see him. Everybody went out to hear him. A actually, that makes sense in light of it looked like a prophet had shown up finally after 400 years. Now, what happened is his message was going to demand some changes of lifestyle for them, and so they lost interest in a hurry, uh, which actually had been the problem with the prophets before. When they demanded lifestyle changes, they weren't interested in following through. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, Mark, are you still in the queue? Uh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Nancy, then Mark, then Jess. Uh, and then we're done for the day. It, uh, it seems to me, I've always kind of wondered how, what was in God's mind when, when the, the northern kingdom separated away. And I'm wondering if God didn't have in mind having a kind of a, an example of what you do when you really go over the top with this. So 
so did the southern kingdom. See, not that they stayed that good either, but, but, but they were a little bit longer. And I heard, I've heard that, that the people that were disgusted, this is Nancy's words here, the people that were disgusted with the way the northern kingdom was living, the way the people that were living there came south and joined. I don't know how complicated that would have been, but participated uh, with the temple and, you know, yep. more... Right. Yeah, I, I think the, there was some of that built around religious fidelity to the right, right. temple and all that sort of thing. It, it, it wouldn't have been hard. You just abandon your property that you've inherited and move to a foreign country and uh, start over and try to figure out where to get a job, where to buy a property, and how to live, and how to survive, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and there was some of that also happened at the fall time, that there were folks who fled in front of the Assyrians and settled in the south. Uh, and got themselves, what, a 140-year reprieve. Mark? Just a quick reminder that even the pronouncement of a coming famine was the word of the Lord and a tremendous act of grace. But for people who may not have liked the peas in the prophets, little green balls of yucky poison, you know, the stuff that they didn't agree with or demanded lifestyle changes, they may not and did not accept um, the word of God. Um, and so we're rejecting even that grace God was giving them. And then the point I wanted to make about the, the remnant is there was the conundrum in Isaiah as to why the remnant was suffering along with the unrighteous group of people. And then it gave rise to you know, what we treasure so much, the concept of the suffering servant um, that also is applied to Jesus. Okay. Yep. Jess. Dennis Kinlaw used to say that one of the simple uh, truths taught in the Old Testament is that life can't go right when you're living wrong. Mm -hmm. Can't go right when you're living wrong. Okay. And uh, <coughs> human history is the history of trying to get things to go right and still live wrong. It starts in Genesis 3, and uh, we're still giving it a shot. <laughs> we really learn quickly and well, don't we? It still doesn't work. Uh, and so we're shocked that there's a famine of the Word of God. Well. Thanks for keeping me awake today. <laughs> Dorothy? Are you done? <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain that to you later. Go I ahead. Well, since I've interrupted, I'll go ahead and then you can finish up. Okay. We'll just pray after you give us good news. going to do intergenerational church and uh, because uh, I suggested that we leave first to fourth grade in the sanctuary today so that they can hear this very famous man one that's an important thing two he works in another country besides our own so they get to experience a little bit of that and they get to hear Spanish news <coughs> in a service worship service to me. So I thought those were all worthy things for the formation of our children. So pray for them during this time. There are only three. That's the thing that hardens my heart. And there are only three children in the first four grade in the building today. Right now. Uh, but because of that, I have left over, so if anybody wants to take a look, they can take a look. You have what? Leftovers of my, Le of my sheet that I made for the children. So oh, you so you did what I told you? Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> this is activities that kids could do while uh, the sermon is going on? While the sermon is going yeah, on. Yeah, so if any of you are struggling uh, also, I pick up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Father, we are delighted to be your children. Thankful that uh, you've given us your word and that we have lived in a time where your word was available with abundance, with generosity, 
in multiple translations and languages. Uh, we are such blessed people. Teach us to live accountable lives to you and to your blessings. We pray your special blessing on Edmano Lopez as he brings the word to us today. Let us hear with uh, glad hearts in Christ's name. Amen.